Hi, <laughs> welcome to an adventure. Uh, today we are exploring some selected works from the Rare Books collection about ornithology and oology. Um, I'm Anthony Wright de Hernandez, the Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech. Uh, before we begin, I just have a couple of announcements. If you've been here at the start of stream before, you know this is a regular thing. Um, I want to acknowledge the Tudelo and Monacan people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live and recognize their continuing connection to the land, water, and air that Virginia Tech consumes. Uh, I want to pay respect to the Tudelo and Monacan nations and to their elders past, present, and emerging. I also acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was previously the site of the Smithfield Plantation. At any point from 1774 to 1865, the Preston family enslaved 40 to 100 African men, women, and children on this land. I want to pay respect to those souls and acknowledge that Virginia Tech is undeniably tied to this legacy. Further, I acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was previously the site of the Solitude Estate, which enslaved at least 30 African men, women, and children on this land. I acknowledge the contributions of the Fraction family and other enslaved persons in the creation and emergence of Virginia Tech as a major land-grant university. So, today, as I said, we're going to be looking at more ornithology and oology stuff. Um, if you're unfamiliar, uh, I will define those terms for you. Hi, Hannah. Welcome to the stream. Welcome to the show. Um, hi, Alice. Good to see you. Um, ornithology is the study of birds, and oology is the study of egg-laying creatures. Um, <clears throat> so in this case, again, looking at birds, because um, that's kind of the focus that I chose for the month of June. Uh, so, yeah, today we're doing some selected items from the Rare Books collection, and then next week, um, next week we have the, a, a collection called Passenger Pigeon Correspondence, um, which is an interesting collection of letters. Uh, and then the week after, we have the M.L. Foley collection, which I honestly do not remember what about that collection said birds? But we'll find out in two weeks. And then next week in July, uh, the plan is to, next week, next month in July, <laughs> the plan is to um, do some stuff on the history of the uh, tradition of American backyard grilling. Um, so some barbecue stuff, some cookbook stuff, um, anything I can find, honestly, related to the backyard party and the uh, kind of grilling craze that kind of came um, in the United States and became a part of the idea of ideal America following World War II. So that is what's coming up for next month. Um, ah, according to Kira, Foley is about mail order bird orders. So that would be why I selected it for <laughs> the month where I'm doing ornithology stuff. Um, I still haven't figured out exactly how I'm going to do the Audubon books. Um, so they won't be happening during the ornithology month uh, because they are very, very large. They are a slight bit shorter than the table and wider than the table that I'm currently sitting at. They're very, very big and also quite heavy. And um, ideally, I need to make sure I have a second person there to help me turn pages and especially to help me change out books if I decide that I want to change out books. Um, it is the one piece in our collection that came with its own piece of furniture. So, uh, someday I will figure out exactly how to do that. But today, we're looking at selected items from the Rare Books collection. And at the moment, that is this. That's all I brought today. Um, I think it will serve us and get us through today. Um, we'll have a good time looking at birds. 
will have a good time looking at eggs. Um, so let me just see here. I'm going to potentially have things switch over. And, <laughs> and Eric has rated us with a party of 51 on the Rogan 27 channel. 16-bit um, Eric, thank you so much for bringing over the Whimsies. Uh, Whimsies, welcome. Um, this is my archives stream. Today we are looking at uh, selected materials from the Rare Books collection at Virginia Tech. Um, the, those selected materials are all focused on the topic of ornithology and oology. So I've got some uh, rare books that we're going to show on stream, kind of talk about and share information about birds and eggs. Um, but also, yeah, welcome in, everybody. Uh, <laughs> I see Lord Portico bowing. Um, and if anybody was watching who is not already following 16-Bit Eric, I do highly recommend 16-Bit Eric. Uh, he is a great streamer does a lot of just chatting, talks a lot about kind of the entertainment industry and the um, streaming industry itself. So definitely worth a follow. Uh, hi, Allura. Um, I was about to switch over to actually show documents. Um, oh, and I will note, um, I don't have it set up with the meter at the moment, but my, how the turns have tabled. Eric, thank you for the thousand bits. Um, I will note uh, for those on the Rogan 27 channel, I am raising money for an archives charity this month. Um, information is in the chat there. If you want to donate, it is uh, the One Archives Foundation, which supports the One National Archives or sorry, the One National Gay and Lesbian Archives at the University of Southern California Libraries. Um, so I'm raising money for Pride Month for the largest and oldest LGBTQ plus archives in the world. Uh, so that information is there if you are at all interested. <laughs> Also, I love the um, Burning Snowman Narwhal, um, Eric. That is, that is nice. Uh, so documents today. I have the standard catalog of North American birds' eggs from 1905. I have birds' eggs and nests and how to find them, which is from 1909. I have... Uh, One that I will try and pronounce in a moment. Let me see here. Um, das kleine Buch der Bogel und Nefter. Um, it's in German. The document camera is upside down. Thank you. I had not noticed it, but thank you, Hannah. Uh, it should be right side up now. <laughs> um, so in German, I don't speak German, but I know this one has good illustrations. Um, I have the Blue Book of Birds of America. And the Red Book of Birds of America. And the Green Book of Birds of America, which are all bird guides. <clears throat> I have, let's see, I think we'll take a peek inside each of them. I don't know which ones are going to be more interesting than others because um, I really haven't seen them before. I have a copy of The Raven which is the Journal of the Virginia Society of Ornithology, and this is the September 1974 issue. I have, let's see, what else do we have? I have uh, multiple issues of the Iowa Ornithologist 
from the late 1800s. Uh, the top one here is April, April 1895. Okay, 1895. And lastly, I have an item here called the Great Auk or Garfowl, its history, archaeology, and remains by Symington Grieve, Edinburgh. Um, and if you're unfamiliar, the great auk is an extinct uh, bird that it, it's basically an aquatic fowl of some sort. It looks to be similar to like a penguin. Um, but I thought that would be interesting. It seemed like an interesting book when I was looking for things to showcase today. Um, do, do, do. Right. So, how is everybody today? I hope that you have all been having a good Wednesday um, and that you'll have a nice chill time with me just taking a look at some birds and birds' eggs. So the standard catalog of <laughs> Tony, I love this day whimsical emotes. Uh, the standard catalog of North American birds' eggs from 1905. Um, and I'm gonna pull up and see what our catalog says. I don't know if our catalog is gonna say anything. Um, I'm gonna try and pull it up by the call number. L37. The Standard Catalog of North, Amer North American Birds' Eggs by Frank H. Latin, uh, or compiled by Frank H. Latin and Ernest H. Short. Um, published by The Oologist in 1905. Uh, title notes. Most versos blank except for heading and not counted in pagination. And it is from the Bailey Law Collection. So last week, or yeah, last week. Um, last week we looked at the Bailey Law Collection. And, and in, indeed, Tony, that handwriting does say Norfolk. Um, I don't know who added that handwriting or when. <clears throat> So the Bailey Law Collection, uh, we took a look at that last week, or at least at portions of it, um, two ornithologists um, who both married the same woman, uh, one of them after the other one's death, and she then donated this collection to Virginia Tech, um, very extensive ornithology collection. Uh, so this book was part of that collection when it came to us. Uh, the Standard Catalog of North American Birds' Eggs, revised, corrected, and brought up to date of going to press. Price, 25 cents, Albion, New York, The Oologist, April 1905. Um, there's a dedication. To Chauncey W. Crandall, Arthur E. Price, Walter Rain, J. Claire Wood, J. Warren Jacobs, uh, Philo W. Smith Jr., and in a lesser degree <laughs> to over 50 leading oologists, the compilers are indebted for a vast amount of valuable information without, rich, without which the completeness of this catalog would have been impossible. The compilers believe this catalog to be the most complete and reliable extant but realize that errors, discrepancies, and inconsistencies may exist. In case you detect either real or imaginary ones, you can offer suggestions for future editions. The same will most gratefully be received by the compilers. Um, These pages are thin and somewhat difficult to turn. Um, so I have a string weight here, 
And I'm just going to use it to weight down the page so that I can focus on it without having to hold my hand there the whole time. Um, so let's see what this says. The numbers following R, actually, I can zoom in a little bit on this book because it's really small. I'll try to pull out to the side, get things centered. Nope. Other way. There. <laughs> the numbers following R were those used by Ridgway in the Smithsonian Catalog of 1881. <clears throat> the numbers following C are those used by uh, Kue in his checklist of 1883. The asterisk following prices signifies that the value given is for European specimens. IS introduced species. In the division and subdivisions of this catalog into orders and suborders, families and subfamilies, we have used the same type for each division as we have used to print the words in this paragraph. All family names have the ending I-D-A-E and all subfamily I-N-A-E. And then there's an example there, Pygopodes, Podicipides and Podicipii. All right. So it is literally a catalog of like prices for bird's eggs. And at the bottom, I'll see if I can move it up a little bit and show. I'll zoom in so that you can see toward the very bottom. We've got 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, etc. Um, and that appears to have been handwritten and added to the book. Um, it's a little notebook, sort of, and you're able to jump to sections that way. Um, and those appear to be the classification numbers. Uh, I believe, nope, I don't know. I guess they're just the, the number for people to reference to in this book itself. Because um, they don't correspond with the R numbers, which were the Smithsonian numbers, or the C numbers, which were um, apparently another publication. But uh, we have the, <clears throat> um, if I look here, Pauludicoli. Gruyere and Gruyere, uh, cranes, rails, etc. Cranes. Um, so this is specifically talking about birds' eggs. So according to this, a whooping crane egg would be seven dollars, and a little brown crane egg would be ten dollars, and a sandhill crane egg would be four dollars. Oh, uh, <laughs> World Night. Um, yeah, I just saw your note. The tabs on the bottom are, it is, it is just jumping to the numerical sections. So if you look at the, um, if you look at an entry, they're all numbered. All of the entries are numbered. And so here we have the Dusky Grouse, the Sooty Grouse, the Richardson's Grouse, and the Sierra Grouse. Um, which are all entry number 297, uh, but then there's 297 A, B, and C. Um, and so this page, on this page, you reach entry number 300. And so that the cutouts and numbers on the bottom are just jumping to that section. Yeah, I figured you heard the, the explanation, but I also was willing to go over it again because I think it's pretty neat. 
Um, so if somebody has a bird that they're particularly interested in and want me to see if I can find, I can try. I don't know what kind of index there is. I didn't see a table of contents particularly. It just jumped into listings of birds. Um, so I don't know that I would necessarily be able to find a particular one. But uh, here on this page, we have the Orioles and Blackbirds and Meadowlarks. Uh, let's see what they, they would be the um, Strunidae or Starlings. Oh, no. Starlings have their own entry here, number 493, um, which is 10 cents an egg. I don't remember what an asterisk meant. I'm going back to the beginning to find out. Asterisk. Value given is for the European species, so European starlings. Um, most likely, given the time that this was published, um, uh, the market for this would have been scientific study. Um, so uh, universities, et cetera, would be looking to buy specimens for their collections, things like that. or. Um, Oh, my brain had another use for it. But honestly, scientific study was the primary market at the time. Um, so, and, and, or for like museums or collections and things like that. That's the primary market that these would be for, rather than for like breeding or consumption or something like that. Um, these books were really, <clears throat> this type of catalog for a variety of birds would be mainly focused on um, that scientific market. Um, Icteridae, blackbirds, orioles, etc. And their prices look to be like 25 cents, 3 cents, anywhere from 2 cents. 2 cents for a red-winged blackbird. So they, I would assume, are fairly common. Where then you get up to like the Audubon's oriole, which is $2 for an egg. Yeah, warmest with conservation. That, but at the time, I don't know that they were particularly interested in conservation the way that we think of it today. Um, so yeah, this would uh, this was uh, even in 1905. We're at the tail end of kind of this idea of natural philosophy and um, the approach to scientific study that is very much curiosity and wanting to document and catalog things. Um, I mean, they weren't particularly interested in protecting the habitats or even maintaining species. They were interested in what can we learn about it and uh, like, yeah. Uh, so, so documenting it a lot of the ornithologists in the 1800s especially were, uh, would illustrate and then notate um, scientific information about birds. Um, but they would also collect specimens, so nests, um, bird, nests, feathers, eggs, and actual specimens of entire birds um, to donate to various uh, kind of museum or scientific collections. Yeah, preservation or cataloging would be better. <laughs> um, the, the questions are not irritating at all, World Night. Don't worry about that. Um, so I don't know for sure how this would have been distributed. Um, based on the title page for the North American Bird's Eggs catalog, um, and the fact that it was 25 cents, I assume it was something that was purchased by someone who wanted to do work in ornithology. So it's possible that 
it was purchased personally or by an organization that somebody would, would have been working for. Um, I think most of the amateur <laughs> ornithologists of the time, like serious amateurs, uh, which Bailey and Law, uh, since, since this came from the Bailey Law collection, um, would sort of qualify as amateur ornithologists. I don't think they were technically professionals. Um, but they would have had that interest because they would have been looking to collect specimens and then sell them. Hobbyists, yes. That is a good word for it. <laughs> um, let's see, this next one is called Birds, Eggs, and Nests and How to Identify Them. Um, I'm going to see what our, whether our catalog has anything um, of note. Sometimes we get notes in the catalogs, in the catalog entries, uh, S43. Um, you can see from the inside cover that this was stamped as part of the Bailey Law Collection from the Biology Department at Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University, um, which is where the Bailey Law Collection was originally donated before the specimens were given to the Virginia Museum of Natural History, so the ne birds' nests and egg, or, uh, nests and, and uh, eggs and bird skeletons and things like that were given to the Museum of Natural History. Um, and the documents and books came here to special collections. I'm hoping I am still streaming. The computer that runs the stream just turned off uh, its screen. OK, there we go. Um, and it does appear that I stayed on the entire time. So that's good. I apparently was not interacting with it enough, and it decided to go to sleep. <laughs> anyway. Um, let me see. There, it says there are four title notes in our catalog for this. It just says, full color plates included in pagination. Publishers catalog a list of new nature books on final 10 pages, binding publishers green cloth printed in white, uh, and then noting that it is the Bailey Law Collection. So uh, the author's name is listed as S.N. Sedgwick. M A. And let's see what's in here. The Young People's Bird's Nest Chart. A simple guide to identify the nests of common British birds by the Reverend S. N. Sedgwick, M A author of the Young People's Nature Study Book, The Romance of Precious Bibles, etc. London, Robert Cully, 25-23 City Road and 26 Paternoster Row, EC. Um, looks like the first edition was published in February of 1909, and this appears to be a reprint from April of 1910. But as you can probably see, if you saw the tweet about the show today, um, the tweet uh, was an interior shot of this book. Um, so here we have British Birds Eggs Plate 1, the Bullfinch, uh, Chaffinch, Goldfinch, Greenfinch, Hawfinch, Shrike, and Linnet. Um, and so they are numbered. I don't know personally, I don't know a ton about um, oology, which is the eggs. I know more about birds, but honestly, even there, I know more about um, typical species of pet birds, especially in the um, Cidicae family, the, the parrot family. Um, so these 
other than being able to see the different coloration and speckling on them, um, I can't add a lot of context unless the book gives it to me. <laughs> uh, plate two, we have the meadow pipit, the black cap, the tree pipit, the wind chat, the greater white throat, the stone chat, the willow warbler, the lesser white throat, uh, the chiff chaff, the corn bunting, and the sedge warbler, and the yellow bunting. And a lot of these are very speckled. Um, I'm not sure. I want to see what else, what comes later in the book after the um, plates. Yeah, we will take a look there in a moment. Um, I thought maybe they would have specific entries on each of the birds featured, but it doesn't. Uh, forward. Addressed to the young people, it is an irritating thing to spend a holiday in the country and not to be able to name the birds' nests and eggs that are discovered in our walks. That is the reason why this key is published separately from the book to which it belongs, the Young People's Nature Study Book. In order that it may prove of some assistance to my young readers upon their rambles in the spring, if they will carry it with them, and it takes up but little room, together with the waistcoat pocket telescope or observing glass mentioned in the above book, they should be well armed and able first to discover and second to name all but the rarest of the nests of British birds. No scientific classification of the birds is attempted, but the nests are grouped according to their locality and position as follows. One, Nests unmistakable with characteristic shapes or eggs of special colors. Two, nests built on the ground of birds as big as a skylark and larger. Three, large nests found chiefly in trees. Four, nests in holes in trees or banks. Five, nests found upon or near fresh water. Six, nests of common seabirds. Seven, nests generally built in rushes, hedges, etc. Eight, nests generally built low down in the bottoms of hedges, bushes, in tufts of herbage, or on the ground. Nine, small birds' nests built in holes, crevices, etc. Ten, small birds' nests that may be found near water in marshy places. The use of the key is fairly obvious. When a nest is found, for example, low down in a hedge or bush, it can be identified by referring to section 8, where additional characteristics of such nests and eggs are described, which should lead by process of elimination to a correct result. The colored plates are those of the eggs most generally confused and should not be an additional help to the young field student. Should this little booklet meet with approval, it is proposed to deal with other phases of nature, uh, other phases of nature study in a similar way in future books. And I just realized that I've been going for half an hour and had forgotten to activate the captions, so they should be on now, and hopefully they are functioning. I'm not sure. It doesn't seem to be. All right. I don't know if that's working. It's working on the VTUL Studios channel, I'm not seeing it on the Rogan27 channel. Hmm. Do, do, do. One second here while I troubleshoot. Just checking my input device.
All right. Uh, there. OK, the captions should be functional now. Sorry about that. Um, I need to look up the yel a yellow bunting now. I have indigo buntings, so I want to know how similar or not they are. I don't know. Um, we may get to some of those. I, I don't know what's illustrated in the other books that I pulled. Um, but there's a yellow bunting egg, number 12, on the page there. The only one you could find is from Japan. Well, this clearly says it is a British bird. So I would hope that there's some from Britain somewhere. But I don't know. Let's see what else we have here. So here we have plate number three. Uh, the pied wagtail, the gray wagtail, the yellow wagtail, the spotted flycatcher, the weeder, the tree creeper, the red start, uh, tree sparrow, blue tit, coal tit, and great tit. I think it's interesting that the red starts egg is blue. I assume that a red start looks red, and would, that would be why it was called the red start. But um, its eggs are blue, which I think is interesting. So this is meant as a field guide and is meant to be like put in your pocket and taken with you so that, oh, I just found a nest. Uh, let's look at the eggs inside and find out what bird laid th these eggs. Um, and apparently by this reverend, that was thought to be a proper activity for young British lads. Um, here we have plate number four, the reed bunting the marsh tit, the hedge sparrow, uh, the house sparrow, the skylark, the common wren, and the gold-crested wren. So they don't seem to be photographs to me. They do appear to be illustrations. Um, which I think is pretty neat. Um, I'm used to seeing illustrations of birds, but seeing the illustrations of the nests, I think, is pretty interesting. A wren's nest in an old hat. But it's in black and white, and it's very hard to make out the detail. I'll zoom in, and uh, I honestly may be able to see it better on the camera than I can leaning over. But you should definitely be able to see it when it's zoomed in, or see it better. Like I said, it's not particularly easy to make out the nest, but that is apparently a wren's nest in an old hat. Uh. This one says wren's nest in sack. Um, I'm sure it's a grand photograph, but I can't make out a nest in there. Here we actually have eggs. Uh, nest and eggs of Montague's Harrier. Interesting, Hannah. The yellow bunting in Britain is called a yellow hammer. Um, I wonder if that name changed after this book was published. Here we have a nest and eggs of Montague's Harrier with eggs of bantam added. Um, now I'm trying to remember what a what bantam means. Well, 
with regard to ornithology. Um, okay. Yeah, bantam is a type of <clears throat> chicken. So this is the eggs of the Montague's Harrier, and there are chicken eggs added. So apparently the Harrier eggs are about the same size as chicken eggs from a bantam chicken. Yeah, Hannah, I had thought it was a chicken, but I had to double check because I was like, well, maybe it's just a descriptor of a, t like a bird. I was like, maybe it's a descriptor for like a, uh, an unusual coloration for a species or something like that. And um, no, it's just, it's just the name of a breed of chicken. <laughs> but not having actually done formal study in ornithology, um, I had to double check to make sure. Because my formal study is in informational organization, not uh, not ornithology. Although I would love to do formal study in ornithology. I, I find it very fascinating. Robin's nest in kettle. There's a little robin in the picture. The black and white photos are kind of hard to make out sometimes. Thrush's nest under a cabbage. Technically, this book is old enough I could probably read the entire thing to you, but we have other things to look at today. Oh, list of birds in following chart in alphabetical order. So what does the chart give us? Um, oh, it's an informational chart about the characteristics of bird nests. Uh, but to find out which bird they're talking about, I think you have to go to the chart. So number one is the blackbird. Material, dry grass, stems, etc., woven with mud. Uh, it is generally compact in character, can be built anywhere. Uh, five eggs. Ground color is bluish green. I don't know what that means. Oh, oh, got it, got it. The, the main color of the egg is bluish green, um, and then it has black, uh, black brown spots and blotches for the blackbird. So actual like descriptive charts in here. Interesting. Uh, and then at the end, as noted in our catalog entry, the last 10 pages are all advertisements. <laughs> the last 10 pages of the book are advertisements for other nature themed books. The Birds and Their Story, a book for young folk by R.B. Lodge. What's interesting, though, is they don't do much to sell you on the book here. Um, it gives a lot of information that, like, this book is targeted at young people. Um, but, like, young people aren't really going to be interested in, well, I will say the majority of young people I don't see as being interested in the fact that 284 pages, um, medium octavo, cloth gilt and gilt top. Um, it was 5S net and the author was medalist, Royal Photographic Society of Great Britain. Gold medal, St. Louis Ex Exhibition 1904. Bronze medal, Paris Ex Exhibition 1900. The author of The Story of Hedgerow and Pond. Bird Hunting Through Wild Europe. Pictures of Bird Life, 
etc. With 157 illustrations reproduced from photographs and eight full-page colored plates. Um, like, that to me is not written as an advertisement to young boys. Reads like the ads in the back of some older scholastic books. No heavy description, no pictures, just a checklist of books with ordering instructions. Yeah, to me it reads like it's being advertised in a library catalog, not as something for like a boy of nine or ten to buy with their meager allowance. Um, even the note at the bottom here. Both author and publisher are to be congratulated upon the production of an exceptionally attractive book. Will be, eager, will be eagerly read by all young nature students who are lucky enough to receive so handsome a book. And that is a quote from the Teacher Times. Um, like, I get that uh, we have this image of, say, Victorian era children being much more disciplined and um, like there's this mythology of, of kids of like the late 1800s, early 1900s being more uh, studious and well behaved and um, you know the, the boy who's going to run out and um, look at birds nests uh, I, I don't think they were this well behaved. This is like not an ad aimed at children. This is an ad aimed at the parents who bought this book for their child. <laughs> but yeah, teachers for their classrooms too. I just, um, I, I, so I am definitely interested in, in birds and ornithology, which is why I've been having fun with stuff this month. Um, but I'm also interested in kind of old advertisements and anytime I'm looking through any of the materials in our collections that have old advertisements in them, um, I stop and take a look. So like we have collections of playbills from the 80s and 90s and they're full of cigarette ads. Um, this nature book is actually not that bad in being filled with ads for other nature books. But uh, I was just interested at the way that the ad was structured and written and who the apparent audience was for the, for the ad. So this one, I won't be able to read very much because um, I've taken a total of one semester of German in my time, but it had really lovely illustrations. So I wanted to um, show include it. Let me see if there are any notes in our catalog. So where I'm going to look for notes is just catalog.lib.vt.edu, um, which is the, um, the main catalog for the University Libraries at Virginia Tech. Uh, and I'm just looking to see if they have any notes. And the only note on this one is that it's part of the uh, no, actually, this is not part of the Bailey Law Collection. Um, it, l the note in this is, uh, in quotation marks, Geleitwort, page 29 to 41, signed Heinz Graupner. Um, so this is Das kleine Buch der Vogel und Nester um, by Bilder von Fritz Kredel. Uh, and appears to have been published by Insel Verlag in 1935. Um, my one semester of German in college is doing overtime at the moment. <laughs> uh, so this is apparently Insel Bucher, Insel Bucher number 100. And while it was not noted in our catalog, it is stamped on the interior that it was part of the Bailey Law Collection. So I, I was actually going to be really surprised that it wasn't part of Bailey Law, but then it turns out it's part of Bailey Law. All right. And so here, 
um, interesting from an archives perspective uh, and just from an archival process perspective, um, we have a piece of paper that was uh, taped into the book with an English translation of the title information. Um, and it was taped into the book using cellophane tape, uh, what in America we might refer to as scotch tape. Um, basically, it's the clear plastic tape that you can just go and buy at the store. Um, as you can see, that tape is basically gone. There's not the nice reflective tape surface. Um, there might be some bits of the tape still there. I can't really tell for sure. But uh, the adhesive um, on this particular cellophane tape uh, was apparently acidic um, or reacted with the paper in such a way it, it has yellowed over time, it has eaten away at the tape. Um, so this is something that you see uh, in a lot of archival materials um, from the period at which cellophane tape was available. Um, it, it deteriorates and, and ends up looking like this. Um, so the English translation is The Little Book of Birds and Nests. The author is not given, but there are comments by Heinz Graupner. Uh, the publisher is Incel Publishing Company in Leipzig. Uh, the date, uh, this is number 100 in the Incel series. No date is given, but it seems to be around 1933 or 1934. So. going to zoom out. You can actually see where the adhesive has bled through and, and you can kind of see it on the back of the page too. Um, old tape is an unpleasant encounter uh, when working with archival materials. Um, not as unpleasant as old rubber bands though. I, I would prefer old tape to old rubber bands. Oh, and I just noticed uh, that when that raid came in, uh, Shadowstorm and Kasima, I just noticed that you followed. If you're still here, thank you so much for those follows. Um, I just was very distracted with the beginning of stream and didn't notice. Um, all right. Der Fanfoning. Now I'm going to use uh, a tool that works very well for uh, helping to translate unfamiliar words in another language. It's called Google Translate. <laughs> uh, generally, for something um, small like this, it works OK. Except, apparently, uh, I just don't, I, I'm not making out the um, actual script that well. I don't know for sure what that first letter is. I thought it was a F, but it doesn't seem like it actually is. Um, and when I type that into Google Translate, it just says, the phone phoning, which makes me think I misspelled it. Das Ah, see that worked. Das uh, Rotfelschen. Um, so the illustration on the left is a robin. Yeah, uh, World Night. The illustrations in this book are gorgeous. Um, which is why, even though it's in German and I like can't read to you, uh, I had to um, I had to include it. Oh, and Kasima, you are still here. And Zahnkoning. Um Let me ah. 
Ah, der Zahnkönig, the wren. <laughs> I knew when it didn't return an actual English translation. Um, <laughs> you are German, so maybe you can help a little. Hey, any help would be appreciated. Um, like I said, I took one semester of German, and half of our textbook uh, was various sentences, including the noun Zigaretten. Our textbook was obsessed with that noun, and um, I didn't learn a lot of other nouns. So, <laughs> um, so anyway, we have a wren, uh, and then we have the robin, which is a lovely illustration with the nest. I, I love the illustrations in old bird books. They are just amazing. Um, I don't know the history of the plates for this, uh, whether these were watercolors um, or what, but I just thought they were gorgeous and I wanted to showcase them. H L C H E N. Um, das Blaufelchen? Ah, Blaufelchen. Interesting. So it does say das Blaufelchen. Blaufelchen. Um, Google suggested that maybe I wanted the word Blauchchen, uh, which has a K instead of an F, um, and that translates to the blue throat, and so I imagine that's actually what it is. My guess is that the name has changed since this book was made. <laughs> you could help if it was Greek, but no training in German. Um, so I originally attended a conservatory. Um, and so they had a lot of like the classical languages because they had an opera program. So I got exposure to French and Spanish and German and Italian, um, a little bit of Portuguese and some Romanian. But I never, um, never got more than a semester in anything. Kelshin <laughs> uh, equals throat. It's a K. I don't know, it, like the letters, if I lean in close, the actual script, it looks like an F, but I believe you. Woo! Uh, I zoomed in a little further than I meant. I apologize for the roller coaster of zooming. Uh, one would think I would be used to this by now since I've been doing this for six months. Uh, but yeah, the script on the page, I look at it and all I see is an F. But um, the word itself has a K, so that's fine. <clears throat> but yeah, it is the blue throat. Um, here, the next page is... I'm going to zoom back out so you can see the illustrations here. Uh, so two birds here, uh, der Echvil, uh, Ech, Echviril, uh, let me try that one, E-C-H-W-I-R-L, nope, that is not what it says, and I do not know what it says. So I'm not sure what bird that is, because I don't know what letters those are. Uh, the, the one next to it, uh, house rot Uh, der Hausratschwang, uh, the red wing. So on the right is the red wing. I'm not certain what letters those are on the, the bird on the left. So I don't know. <laughs> 
Don't know what bird that is. Swirl. Okay. <laughs> Kasima, thank you. Um, and Google actually recommended that to me as what it might be. And honestly, it's just called, that just translates into English as the swirl. Um, grass warblers. Oh, hi, Fluden. I am sorry. <laughs> I saw your notes and then I just never commented. Uh, but hi, and thank you for helping. Um, der Garten Uh I'm assuming that is the Garden Red Wing. Or, well, in English it is the red start, but the <laughs> garden red tail. Um, but yeah, it is, it's the, the red start. It's called the red start in English. Uh, der Weidenlaubsanger. And I apologize uh, for however I am butchering the pronunciations on these. Weiden Laub Sanger. Interesting. That, no, that's okay. The Willow Warbler. <laughs> so this whole book is full of these lovely illustrations. Uh, and then you get um, some commentary at the back, which is entirely in German and is still in this very, um, it's an old style script. So the, the printing of it, the letters don't always f conform to what we would expect them to look like. Um, like, as you can see in a lot of these, um, we have the F shape, the elongated um, S, which, given that this was published in the 1930s, I would e expect to be beyond that. So um, I'm guessing that this is just a stylized font that they were using for it. Um, that is fine, it looks really pretty, but it is sometimes difficult for me to make out exactly which letter they're going for. <laughs> um, like, I have no problem with the, the I forget what it's called, the, the long S. Um, if there's a name for it, um, the medial S. Uh, like, I, I don't really have a problem with that, but some of the capital letters here um, just trip me up. <laughs> Let's see, what time is it? It is 3.34, we have an hour left. Um, I do wanna look at some of the other materials I grabbed, but uh, if we have time left at the end, we'll come back and look more at more of these illustrations. Because <laughs> I, I love this one, as far as the illustrations in it. So next, let's look at the Blue Book of Birds of America and the Red Book of Birds of America, and the Green Book of Birds of America. <clears throat> so, there's all three books there. Let me see what our catalog says, if anything. Um, grab one of these. I'm looking it up by call number because 
that gets me exactly the right one. The Blue Book of Birds of America by Frank G. Ashbrook, illustrated by Paul Mahler. This is one of a series of three books. Ta-da! We have all three. Includes an index, a bird guide containing the following orders of birds, goat suckers, swifts, etc., perching birds, including the tyrant flycatchers, larks, crows, and jays, starlings, icteridae, and finches. And this comes from the Marion Clifford Harrison and Teresa Nash Harrison collection, which I am unfamiliar with. So let me look at that one and see what we can learn. <clears throat> I'm not sure. I'm looking at our finding aid site to see Marion Clifford Harrison and Teresa Nash Harrison. Marion. I wonder if this maybe was a collection of just books uh, and not manuscript materials. Because I'm not finding anything that comes up. Um, so that would be my guess, that it came in as part of a collection of books that was donated to us and that we don't have any like personal papers or anything that goes with it. <laughs> Tony, that is awesome that you're listening to birds outside while you're watching this. All right. Let's see what is in these catalogs. So uh, rather, not catalogs, guides. <clears throat> the Blue Book of Birds of America. Uh, which apparently contains goat suckers, swifts, perching birds, including the tyrant flycatchers, larks, crows, and jays, starlings, icteridae, and finches, as I just read a minute ago. Uh, the red book contains diving birds, swimmers, herons, storks, ibises, marsh, dweller, marsh dwellers, shorebirds, pigeons and doves, birds of prey, cuckoos and woodpeckers. And the green book contains orders of perching birds, including tanagers, swallows, waxwings, shrikes, vireos, warblers, pit pipits, dippers, mimic thrushes, wrens, nuthatches, and creepers, titmice, wren tits, kinglets, gnat catchers, and thrushes. So let's see what these guides look like inside. Oh, neat. When was this from? Was there a date? 1931, published in Racine, Wisconsin by Whitman Publishing Company in 1931. All right, I'm going to zoom in because this book is small enough that I can. Birds are beautiful and graceful creatures. Not only do birds satisfy our aesthetic sense through their handsome plumage and their sweet voices, but they are marvel marvelously adapted to their respective fields of activity. They are a valuable asset because they depend largely for their food on insects which are injurious to plant life. No other creatures are so well fitted to capture flying insects as swallows, swifts, and nighthawks. The wrens, trim of body and agile of movement, creep in and out of the holes and crevices and explore rubbish heaps for hidden insects. The woodpecker, whose whole body exhibits wonderful adaptation of means to end uh, is provided with strong claws for holding firmly when at work, a chisel-like bill driven by powerful muscles to dig out insects and drag forth the concealed larvae safe from other foes. 
The game birds furnish sport for great numbers of people who love to go afield with dog and gun. Certain kinds of game birds, such as quail, pheasants, and ducks, are raised in considerable numbers on preserves and on farms for commercial purposes. This book is designed to furnish some knowledge of birds and to encourage more interest in their habits. 64 birds that inhabit various parts of the country are described. A colored illustration of each is given so as to enable the reader to identify the bird. The descriptions of the birds are necessarily brief, but they are believed to be sufficient to acquaint the reader with the most prominent characteristics. Special acknowledgement is due the Bureau of Biological Survey, the National Association of Audubon Societies, and the American Ornithological Union for the liberal use which has been made of their publications. Much material has also been taken from the two volumes entitled Birds of New York. Every picture represents a male of the species, the measurements being given from the tip of the bill to tip of tail. And if you're unfamiliar with why they would choose to represent the male of the species, rather than the female of the species, if they are choosing only to represent one, the male is by far going to be the more visually interesting specimen. Um, the females of the species in a lot of these are actually going to end up looking very similar to one another, where the males might vary dramatically. Um, and that's because the males in bird species um, are the ones that have the extravagant plumage to attract a mate. And the females tend to be very earth tones or dun colored or um, toned down in markings. Um, and that's just fairly typical of birds. So the first entry in this book is the whippoorwill. Uh, Antrostomus vociferus vociferus, length nine and a half inches. The whippoorwills and the night hawks belong to the family of the goat suckers, a most unusual name for birds. In Europe, the people believed that these birds lived by milking the goats, a superstition that came no doubt from the sight of the birds flying close to the goats in the twilight to feed on the numerous insects surrounding them. The goat suckers have small, weak feet, but strong, well-developed wings. Their main food consists of insects, and in the twilight, most of their time is spent flying about, sweeping up the insects from the air. But during the day, they rest much of the time. Though often heard, these birds are rarely seen except at twilight when they utter their peculiar rhythmic calls. The whippoorwill is named after its call note. The male can be distinguished from the female being buff colored. Wait. So. The male can be distinguished from the female by a white breast band, that of the female being buff colored. The whippoorwill does not make a nest, but lays two eggs on the ground or on other flat surfaces. Let's see. Uh, if somebody has a bird that they particularly want me to find, I will see if it is in here. We have a poor will, a night hawk. Night hawk is a uh, superhero name from the DC comic book series, if I recall correctly. Um, and considering that when Eric brought his raid over, he had just been playing Mutant Year Zero, uh, I will read this entry in honor of um, that superhero connection there. <laughs> any, any reason is a good reason to read about birds. The Nighthawk. Uh, Cordelais virginianus virginianus, length 10 inches. The night hawk is another member of the goat sucker family and is somewhat like the whippoorwill in form. Detail of color, somewhat like the whippoorwill in form, detail of color and markings. Its call is a nasal peent, peent, pent peent. During the twilight hours, this bird can be seen making high dives from far up in the sky. 
When it almost reaches the treetops, it spreads its wings, checks its descent, and glides gracefully upward again, only to repeat its high-diving stunt. When seen from below, the nighthawk seems to have a hole in its wings, an effect that is produced by a very conspicuous white mark across the outer wing quills. The male nighthawk has a white breast band and a white band in the tail, marking that a marking that is missing in the female, which has the throat buff. Like a whippoorwill, the nighthawk nests on the ground but lays its eggs in the fields or on pebbly roofs. The nighthawk winters in the tropics and starts north in April. In summer, it dwells in the territory from the Gulf states north to Canada and Alaska. Oh, I, Hannah, I didn't know there was also a Nighthawk in the Marvel Universe. Uh, a supervillain turned hero, turned superhero. I did not know that. The only Nighthawk I could think of was um, the one associated with Batman um, after Robin grows up and becomes Nighthawk. Uh, I'm going to zoom out so that you can see two pages at once. because I'm going to flip through some. If we see something that catches our eye and you want an entry read, do let me know. I'd be happy to read any of them. Um, but I'm just going to flip through, because we've got three of these, and we've got some other stuff to look at, too. Says Phoebe, Wood Peewee, Western Wood Peewee, Acadian Flycatcher, Horned Lark, Magpie, Least Flycatcher and Stellar's Jay, Blue Jay, Canada Jay. Oh, you are right, Hannah. It is Nightwing, not Nighthawk. But that was where my brain went with. When I saw Nighthawk, my brain went immediately to Batman. And uh, but you are correct. That character's name is Nightwing, not Nighthawk. Uh, Okay, can you hear me now? Am I back? Okay. Um, the, uh, the batteries died in the uh, lavalier, so <laughs> that's all. Using battery-operated devices, and the battery went out. Lord Portico, hi. You're still here. Um, All right, so I'm going to read about the puffin. Uh, Fragicula artica artica, length of 13 inches. I enjoy burbs too, Lord Portico. I'm glad that you're hanging out and just, it, you know, anybody who's watching, whether you're chatting or just chilling and uh, listening in the background, or thank you. Thank you a lot. It means a lot. The puffins <clears throat> resemble soldiers standing in erect attitude with black backs, collars, crowns, and white faces and underparts. The large, tricolored, flattened beak is a curiosity. 
The puffin is a skilled swimmer and expert diver. It often descends to a great depth and it is exceedingly quick in its motions underwater. When the bird is on the wing, the flight is rapid but labored. On returning to its nest with fish, it utters a peculiar sound, a deep-throated mirthless laughter. The nest is generally a burrow in the ground, one to four feet in length. One egg, white or brownish white, plain or marked with faint spots, is laid at the end of the burrow on a thin layer of grass. The birds show strong affection for one another, and it seems possible that they remain mated for life. The natives of the shores of the North Pacific Ocean catch puffins in nets using their bodies for food and their skins for clothing. What is really interesting is that I never knew that puffins could fly at all. I assumed they were seabirds and seabirds alone and this says that when they do fly it is a labored flight and doesn't last long. But apparently puffins can fly and I, I learned that today. <laughs> Portico, I don't have a command like that. I do have a thank you command of some sort. I don't remember what it says uh, or what the actual command is. Um, I'm sure Kira might be able to get it. <laughs> oh, I remember it. Um, let's see if another one pops out to us here. Zoom back out. I wish I could have presets on the camera uh, so that I had like, d could have different presets where uh, instead of just having to like experiment with how, how far the zoom is going to be. Uh, cormorant. White pelican. Although this is definitely not what this camera was meant for. This camera was meant for a professor who is showing eight and a half by eleven piece of paper after eight and a half by eleven piece of paper. Uh, <laughs> not somebody showing off various uh, historic books and other things on a live stream on the internet. <laughs> um, Kira, that is a possible thing if you, if you do, uh, <laughs> the scarlet tanager, the western tanager, the summer tanager. The purple martin, the cliff swallow, the tree swallow, the barn swallow. Ooh, look at that tree swallow. Look how green that bird is. <gasps> Kasima, thank you for being here. It was lovely to see you. I do archive stuff uh, once a week here starting at 2.30 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and the next couple of weeks will all be bird things. And then we're doing American grilling. Uh, so like backyard grilling type stuff for July. Um, but we have more bird stuff in our collections. And so there'll be more birds at some point. <laughs> but thank you for stopping in and hanging out for a while. And for following. Uh, Cedar waxwing, bohemian waxwing. Let's see. So far, most of these are not ones I'm familiar with. Yellow warbler, golden winged warbler, blue winged warbler, a pipit dipper, brown thrasher. A titmouse! 
Oh, and a pygmy nuthatch. The plain titmouse. Uh, Paris inoratus. Uh, zoom in a bit for you. Ah! I held the button too long again. I'm a sorry. I did not mean to hold the button that long. I am very sorry. Um, okay, let's try this. Will this work? It's hard to hold the book open so that you all can see everything. I might just center the picture for you and read to you. The plain titmouse, <coughs> sorry, Paris inoratus, length of five inches. <laughs> the plain titmouse resides in the Pacific Coast country of California and Oregon. It is a plain, unmasked bird with brownish or olive gray underparts and if one observes closely the live oak trees, one may see this small creature or hear its to wit, to wit, clearly enunciated. Uh, though small in size, birds of the titmouse family are far from being insignificant in the matter of food habits inasmuch as they are very numerous. As against one place being occupied by the larger birds, ten are being searched for food at the same time by groups of these smaller birds. The character of the food eaten gives peculiar value to the services eaten, sorry, gives peculiar value to the services of these little birds since most of it is compo composed of small insects and their eggs that wholly escape the search of the large feathered hunters. The titmice remain within their range throughout the year, continuing their search for insects during the winter. So those are the blue, red, and green books of Birds of America, uh, three bird guides from the 1930s. Um, going to move on to the next item. Let us take a look at the raven. It is not like a writing desk, but it is a journal of Virginia, the Virginia Society of Ornithology. So a journal rather than something that you use to support weight while you're journaling. Sorry, every time I see the title of it, I just think of Edgar Allan Poe, and then I think of why is a raven like a writing desk. But anyway, this is the uh, Journal of the Virginia Society of Ornithology from September 1974, volume number 45, number three. Um, <clears throat> It includes a checklist of the birds of Montgomery County, Virginia, which is where Virginia Tech is located, uh, banding results at Kipta Kip Peak Beach in 1973, a white ibis in the Appalachian region of Virginia, uh, lesser black-backed gull at Chincoteague Refuge, raven nesting in Piedmont, Virginia, and then uh, an immemorium section, a news and notes section, and annual meetings of the Virginia Society of Ornithology. Um, so I'm interested to see, these are essentially scholarly articles. I will not be reading them. Um, they are new enough to be under copyright if somebody wanted to claim them and uh, Scholarly articles tend to be a bit dry for a stream anyway. But we have a checklist of the birds of Montgomery County, which I thought sounded interesting. It's literally a list, which it is a checklist. So therefore, a list. And I did it again. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, but how is a raven like a writing desk? 
Um, so let's see. There are dates shown. I suppose I should look at the introduction. The area covered by this list includes all of Montgomery County, the city of Radford, and that part of the New River bordering on them. It is largely situated on a plateau through which runs the Eastern Continental Divide and is partly dissected by the tributaries of two rivers. The northeastern part is drained by the Roanoke River, which flows eastward to the Atlantic Ocean, while the south southwestern part is drained by the New River, which flows via the Kanawha, sorry, via the Kanawha, the Ohio, and the Mississippi into the Gulf of Mexico. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, this list is a result of the observations and records of a number of people over a period of 82 years. The earliest records are available, are available are the two papers in the AUK published by Professor Ellison A. Smith, Jr., reporting his observations from 1891 to 1925. Um, interestingly enough, when we were looking at the uh, Bird Books last week, the, um, the Birds of Virginia, published by Bailey last week, it also referenced Ellison A. Smith, Jr. and uh, the paper published in the AUK. There are outstanding bills on both. <laughs> that one's good. A raven is like a desk because you never get it the wrong way around. Some silica. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> oh, and Kira, Kira put the joke in both chats. Um, <clears throat> so the AUK is a journal of ornithology. Um, let's see. So basically it's just a scientific listing of birds that have been found in Montgomery County, Virginia. Um, or documented to be there. So therefore, a checklist if you're wanting to, to find all of the birds in Montgomery County, even though it, it initially says that they may not all actually still be in Montgomery County. Um, less interesting than I had hoped it was going to be, but if you are in into actual like scientific analysis and study of birds in this county, uh, I suppose it's interesting then. Um, yes, Kira, exactly. Speak attack. So next, I have a number of issues here of a publication called The Iowa Ornithologist. Go forth under the sky and list to nature's teachings. Um, ooh, let's see. Volume 1, number 3. Volume 1, number 2. Volume 2, number 1, Volume 2, number 2, Volume 2, number 3, Volume 3, number 2. So I do not have Volume 1, number 1, but I do have Volume 1, number 2, the second ever issue of the Iowa Ornithologist dated January 1895, and it is somewhat fragile. So we're going to get out the foam, uh, and I'm going to look at it on the foam. So let me zoom out a bit so you can see. So the Iowa Ornithologist, a quarterly magazine devoted to ornithology and oology. 40 cents per year. So that would be 10 cents an issue if it's a quarterly magazine. Published for the Iowa Ornithological Association. So this came to us again as part of the Bailey Law Collection. On the left, I think is an ad followed by the contents. 
Bird's eggs, instruments and supplies, the largest and most complete stock in America to select from at rock bottom prices. We buy and sell large or small collections outright or on commission. A fine lot of singles and typical sets constantly on hand. Send stamp for 1895 catalog. Fred W. Stack, Poughkeepsie, New York. And then it gives the, the table of contents. Iowa ornithologists. Uh, there's an insert here, which is a card. Oh, it's a renewal slip uh, or an order slip um, date, dated 1895 with a spot for you to fill in the rest of the date. David L. Savage, editor of the Iowa Ornithologist, Salem, Iowa. Herewith find 40 cents, for which please send me Iowa Ornithologist for one year. Uh, and then a spot for you to enter your address. It's hard to make out the actual text on the bottom line here. Uh, send by P.O. Money. Ah, got it. Except it doesn't say send. Anyway. Um, I think it might be R-E-M indicating like remit by P.O. Money order or four dimes securely wrapped. So we have the Iowa Ornithologist, Volume 1, Salem, Iowa, January 1895. There's a website with record books for the Iowa Ornithologist Association from June 18, 1984, or do you mean 1894 to 1898? Uh, looks like they featured the American woodcock at the beginning. Um, Hannah, if you want to share a link to that website, it would be appreciated. Just uh, wait a moment until Kira can give you permission to post a link. Um, and then we can copy that link over into the other chat as well. So it looks like short little entries on some of the birds. Thank you, Hannah. Um, the American woodcock, Philohela minor. This species is one of our most interesting and beautiful game birds, some 11 or 12 inches long, the male being quite a good deal less, with a bill three inches long, wing five and one half inches, tarsus one and one fourth inches, middle toe and claw one and three fourths inches, the toe very slender and soft. Tail is only one and one half inches long, composed of 12 feathers. Um, the eye is placed far back and very high in the head, giving the bird a rather droll appearance. But for all that, he is not as foolish a bird as he may be foolish looking. About sunset, or rather between sunset and dark in the months of April and May, he in his way is very musical, although his notes are not very charming to our ears, being composed of a few harshly uttered notes, which may, with a very little imaginative help be rendered into the words cuckoo, speak, the last word more guttural than the first. Sometimes when he is performing his evening exercises, it is quite difficult to obtain a shot at him as he is extremely shy and wary. The least movement of the arm to level the gun upon him is discovered and away he goes. You're trying to shoot the little bird? Um... Flying in a wide circle and mounting higher and higher until he seems quite exhausted. Then he commences a series of notes resembling the words chick, 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 chow, chow. 
and the nearer the commencement of his downward flight, the faster he repeats his notes. The last two words are repeated in mu a much lower scale than the first. Then you see him coming down like a plummet, but before he touches the earth, he spreads his wings, and fluttering a few feet above the ground, he alights as graceful as a snowflake, and if nothing suspicious appears in his view, again begins his song. This bird, although a lover of watery and marshy ground, always nests on high ground, and a peculiarity I have observed in them is they carry their young, when very small, to the water's edge, and then after a time, back to high ground. William Savage. And there's now an Iowa Ornithologist's Union founded in 1923. Thank you, Hannah, for sharing the links. I'm clicking on the first one now. Um, Oh, and that appears to be from the special collections at the at Iowa State University in Ames. Uh, they have a record book for the Iowa Ornithologists Association covering the period from 1894 to 1898. And the other one um, appears to be Yeah, another, uh, oh, this it looks like it's maybe the scan of it? I'm not sure. Oh yeah, if you actually click into, wait, that says 1932. I don't know, but both links are for Iowa State University um, and their special collections, and yeah, they appear to be probably related to uh, either this journal or the sponsoring organization, because the sponsoring organization was the Iowa Ornitholo Ornithological Association, so um, appear to be from the same organization. And, and Hannah, incidentally, um, when I was looking for things to pull and show on today's show, um, the moment I saw this one, I pulled it because I knew that you were out in Iowa and thought that it might be of interest. So you show up all the time. So when I saw an item related to Iowa, I picked it up uh, to include. With a meadowlark. One of our most common summer residents. In mild winters, when there is plenty of food, they remain with us, frequents meadows and pastures. A curious habit of this bird is that while it seems to seek the vicinity of man in its choice of nesting sites, it will invariably desert its eggs if they once be discovered by a human being, though it seems to pay no attention to the passing of cattle. Nests on the ground, and are built and roofed over dry grass and lined with fine grass. Eggs, usually five, sometimes six, song may be heard from the early morning until after dusk. Interesting. I assumed it was a typo, but no, every time they type the word until, it has two L's at the end. <laughs> Uh, in Van Buren County, this species can almost be called a resident, for they are occasionally seen in the winter. However, it is a common summer resident. On May 12, 1894, found a nest which contained five fresh eggs. The nest was placed in an oat field, a bunch of old corn stalks, which... Yeah, the nest was placed in an oat field, a bunch of old corn stalks which formed an archway over the nest. The nests are very difficult to find. In the museum at Ames, there is an albino specimen of the species. So those are quotations from different people observing about the bird. Two broods are sometimes raised in a season, for I have taken fresh eggs May 5 and as late as July 10. On May 10, 1892, I found a nest of the meadowlarks which contained four of its eggs and one of the bobwhites. Common summer resident in Buena Vista County, nests in the dry grass of meadows and in bunches of old hay. The nests are often roofed over. The eggs reach six in number. They arrive during March. They love to sing from high places and 
perched upon a fence post or housetop will pour such a joyous strain at regular inter intervals. They're gre gregarious to some extent during the fall migrations, leaving this locality in October. Have seen this species in midwinter, and it is possible that some belated individuals may reside with us. Interesting. So these are, it seems to be just a journal of observations about birds that are known to be in Iowa uh, and people's observations of having seen them. Oh, look, an ad. You just looked up the Orchard Oriole because you weren't familiar with it? Uh, yeah, that one's in here. I don't know if I have time to read the entry on it at the moment, but let me look at this ad real quick and I might flip back. Although this is only the second issue, the Iowa ornithologist has already made many warm friends all over the country judging from the subscriptions, advertisements, and many encouraging letters received. We hereby thank our many friends for their kind support. We send out several hundred sample copies of this issue. If you receive one of them, send in your subscription at once, because the next sample copy may not come to you. You can't afford to miss it, so subscribe now. 40 cents only will ensure you one year's subscription. Nicely illustrated. Wait. Four numbers and everyone interesting, valuable, and nicely illustrated. I don't recall seeing illustrations in here. Uh, and in addition, you will be helping on the good work of establishing an ornithological magazine in the Mississippi Valley. Those who wish to commence their subscription with the first number can do so. The following is the contents of that number. Interesting. Let me see. Can I find the Orchard Oriole? Orchard Oriole. We'll read this, we'll take a peek at the great auk, and then it'll be the end. Uh, a, plentiful summer, a plentiful summer resident throughout the state builds its beautiful nest, which is composed of green grass, nearer the ground than the nest of the Baltimore Oriole. The following are three sets I have taken. June 29, 1891, one to three, incubation advanced, nest in Lombardy poplar. June 25, 1892, 1 to 4, and 1 cowbird's egg, fresh, nest in Lombardy poplar, 15 feet from the ground and composed of greenish grass and lined with cotton. June 24, 1893, 1 to 5, incubation advanced, nest in willow, 10 feet from the ground. Rather more plentiful in Van Buren County than, in than the Baltimore Oriole, nests not exactly pendant, but placed in the forked twigs of a tree and not quite as ingeniously made as the Baltimore's nest. Usually nests in orchard trees have found the nest in a spruce tree 30 feet from the ground. The male is a nice singer in the spring, the last one seen August 29, 1894. So it seems to be similar to a Baltimore Oriole, but just slightly different. Incidentally, the next entry in the, uh, in the ornithologist here, uh, the one following that is the entry for the Baltimore Oriole, which apparently also is an Iowa bird. All right, let me move this. They look like the Baltimore Oriole, but with a darker red orange instead of the bright orange of the Baltimore. All right. Um, just going to look a little bit here at the Great Auk or Garfowl. You have at least three pairs of Baltimore Orioles that come to your feeder. That is pretty cool. I know my, my grandmother in southwest Iowa um, 
used to put out feeders specifically to attract cardinals. Because um, she had previously worked at Cardinal Glass in Greenfield. And she liked the birds. So I, I found the, prem the premise, the preface to this book somewhat interesting. Oh, stop. It wasn't advancing, and then I thought I held it too long. Apparently not. In submitting these pages to the public, the author has fears that they will not bear severe criticism. But he must plead. Sorry, I just touched my mic, and I hope it didn't blow out your ears. Uh, Orioles love grape jelly, and apparently cat birds do too. I would not have thought to find that out. <coughs> Uh, when is this from? Sorry. Um, it doesn't seem to have a date. 1885. In submitting these pages to the public, the author has fears that they will not bear severe criticism. But he must plead as some excuse that they have been compiled during the relaxation of evenings that have followed the toils of active business life. If chance circumstances had not led him to devote some study to the subject of uh, Alia Impenis, Lynn, and in course of time brought within his reach a considerable amount of literature bearing upon the history, archaeology, and remains of this extinct bird, it is most improbable that he would ever have undertaken this work. As his studies progressed, he was led to suppose that it might be of some use to ornithologists, if not also to a number of general readers, if he were to publish the information collected, as no detailed work on the subject existed, and the scattered notices regarding uh, Alia Impenis, principally to be found in the publications of the learned societies, are difficult to access. The author is deeply sensible of the obligations he is under to home and foreign savants for the information they have so willingly given, as has enabled him to make his work much more complete than he at one time supposed was possible, and also to give all the latest information. Uh, and then it, it gives Thank yous. Um, I also, I found this one of interest because I kept seeing mentions of the auk, um, which happens to be uh, a scholarly publication on the topic of ornithology. Um, and so this, when I saw, saw it originally, I thought, oh, it's just going to be copies of that publication. But no, it is not. This is a book about the actual bird, the great auk. The following pages have been written in the hope of interesting some in the story of an extinct bird. The whole history of the great auk is a sad one. The continued slaughters of the helpless victims culminating in the final destruction of the race on the Skiri, named Eldi, off the coast of Iceland, excites to pity. The last of the great ox has lived and died. The race were, was blotted out before naturalists, when too late, discovered it was gone. Regrets are now useless. The living garfowl is extinct. Mankind, when the prize they value has passed from their grasp, wish it back again. But the great ox has gone forever and has left but few of its remains to call its existence to the recollection of the future naturalists of the world. Forty or fifty years ago, it was only among a small circle of ornithologists that the great auk was known and acknowledged. If in wider circles it had been heard about, it was looked upon as a myth. Now it is acknowledged by all and has afforded perhaps more material for discussion than any other British bird. Though much has been written and published in Britain and the continent during the last thirty years, with the view of putting on record what is known regarding the great auk, all the information regarding it has, with the exception of the necessarily meager, very meager accounts given in popular works of natural history, appeared in the private publications of some of the learned societies. 
We therefore propose to go into greater detail in these pages, not with the impression that we have much to relate that is new to British ornithologists, but more with the desire to bring within the reach of all materials that at present are difficult to access. Uh, let me see what I can get image-wise, because we don't have a lot of time. So there's a section on Danish remains, excavations at Orense, uh, trying to see, oh, here's a illustration of the upper mandible of a great auk found in a cave near Whitburn Lizards. County Durham during 1878. Natural size from a drawing by John Hancock, Esquire. The habits of the Garafowl appear to have led it to frequent those isolated situations where, under ordinary circumstances, it would be free from molestation by men as the bird's want of the power of flight made it so helpless when on land. So another bird uh, that could not fly um, and was hunted to extinction. Uh, trying to see, I know there were some illustrations in here, but I don't know where they were because I don't do a ton of preparation for these. Um, I like to organically encounter things along with all of you. Uh, but we are basically out of time. I'm going to th throw a beautiful image in here for a second. Um, just going to see if I can maybe find a picture of a great awk uh, or of a drawing of one. Uh, oh, is this? Yeesh. There. I'm going to flip over. Um, World Knight, you are absolutely welcome. I'm going to show, I just want to show off. So that is what the great auk supposed, supposed to have looked like in life. Um, it's a large seabird similar to like a penguin, uh, but has now gone extinct. Um, and was extinct before the end of the 1800s uh, when naturalists were very interested in studying them. Anyway, we are at the end of our time for today. I want to thank everybody who stopped by. Um, I definitely want to thank Eric for the raid on the Rogan 27 channel um, and uh, the bits and the couple of people that followed over there. Um, we will be back next week continuing with ornithological content by looking at the passenger pigeon correspondence, um, which is not correspondence that was carried by passenger pigeons, but rather correspondence with scientists about the causes of the extinction of the passenger pigeon. So we will be looking at a manuscript collection that was collected by a former head librarian from Virginia Tech uh, regarding the demise of the passenger pigeon, and that will be next Wednesday. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and set up a raid here. Let me see. Yep, we are going to go over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Uh, it looks like they have one of the sea cams up today. I don't know which one, um, but if you are at all interested, um, it, they are a lovely uh, organization and they have, oh, it's the Shark Tank today. Um, so they are always a nice, calming, kind of chill thing to have on in the background and we will head on over there. 
um, and give them some support. But yeah, thank you all for stopping by. I hope you're having as much fun with birds as I am this month. Uh, but if not, we will be looking at the history of the uh, American grilling tradition next month. So keep on stopping by, and I hope to see you again in the future. I'm going to um, switch to the ending screen, and then we'll pop on over to the aquarium. Bye.